I'm absolutely excited about where we are in the Bible tonight. So open up in your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. The reason I'm so excited is as a Bible teacher, one of my absolute favorite, one of my absolute favorite things to dig into is the law. Is the law. And I know that sounds totally weird. For a lot of you, you're like, when you read through the Bible or try, you get kind of bogged down in Exodus and Leviticus in this spot. But as of, I find this section of the Bible to be so fascinating to see the laws that God gave to his people. Now, I mean, we did the Ten Commandments and it took us four weeks to get through them. But really, the, the specifics of the law really begin now. Because what you have is that Oh, right here in the middle of Exodus chapter 20, verse 22, all the way through Exodus 24 is what they call the book of the covenant. And that comes right out of Exodus 24, 7. And so it's really the first hashing out of the law. And then we're going to see it amplified in different ways. And so before we start, I think it's important to remember, if you were with us on the Sunday mornings when Pastor Bill and I did the top 10 series, I did a message on Psalm 19. And Psalm 19, verse 7, says this, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Now, I bring that out because as we're really going to get down into the nitty-gritty of the law, it's important to remember that the law is perfect. It converts the soul. God's testimonies are sure. It makes wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, and they rejoice the heart. Now, and it keeps going on. Now, how is that possible? Because as we study the law, you have to remember that the law drives each one of us right into the arms of Jesus. That's the law's job. It is perfect. Every statute is perfect. There's a perfect reason why it's in there. But none of us can keep the law. Not only in action, but also in motivation and intention. So in all the ways as we're studying, and we're going to be studying the law from Exodus, keep going out to Leviticus, to Numbers and Deuteronomy. So at the rate we're going, we're going to be here for a year or two, working our way through. We're going to keep reminding ourselves that the law's job is to drive us into the arms of Jesus. That's its job. And and when we go through the law and we find ourselves convicted, transgressing the law, breaking the law, being like, oh no, this is bad. Don't forget the reason Jesus Christ came and died on the cross and rose again is because according to this law, all of us fall short. Not one of us except Jesus Christ stands up to this law and is declared righteous. So we like to joke here on Sundays where I make you turn and look at the person next to you and say, sinner. And we do it the other side. We do that on Sundays and everyone laughs. But like, we're going to study. It's going to show us that all of us fall way short. And that's exactly why Jesus died. God loves humanity so much that he would fill in the gaps and empower our lives because all of us fall short of the perfections of God's law. Now, we just got the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai with great cataclysmic happenings. There's thunders and there's lightning and there's fire. There's all this stuff going on and the people are certifiably freaked out. They're like, Moses... We can't talk to the Lord. We can't survive this in the presence of a holy God. We can't handle this. So Moses, you've got to go talk to him for us. And it sets up the need for a mediator between God and the people. And we made the case, and we talked about it again on Sunday, that Jesus is the mediator. He's the new and better Moses. He brokers a better covenant that he has sustained in his own blood. Moses was temporary for the children of Israel. But Jesus is the fulfillment. Now, we're going to jump 
right on in in verse 22 of Exodus chapter 20. As we begin, as we open the book of the covenant, it says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves. An altar of earth you shall make for me. And you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. And if you make an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone. For if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. Now, he talks to Moses, the Lord, and he says to them, you know that I've spoken with you, right? Then in verse 23, you shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver, gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. It's interesting. He says, look, you know I talked to you, and then he goes back to the first two commandments again. Don't make a god to be with me. Not gods of silver, gods of gold. If you think about the Bible over and over again, it says that no one has seen God at any time. Now we know God has revealed himself to different people in different ways. But one of the key aspects of who God is in the Bible is God's invisibility. Now we know that God revealed himself to different people in different ways. We'll see it. But overall, God is seen as invisible. Now why is that important? Because in all the cultures around the children of Israel, they had images of God. They had all sorts of statues. Everybody's gods was visible except for the almighty, sovereign, creator, covenant-keeping, sustainer of Israel. And God is serious. No gods of silver or gold. And what's interesting, in just a few chapters, they're going to make a golden calf and they're going to dance around it. But God goes back again. No other gods before me and no carved images. No carved images. And the key and the application for us is always in America, in the West, we are too sophisticated in a lot of spheres to worship images. But a lot of us worship gods of chrome, gods of simplex. Our homes, our vacation homes, our 401ks, which is all just numbers. Now, none of these things are wrong. Your boat, your, your toy car, your this, that, your favorite camera, your nicest base, to put myself in the, in, the, in the group with the rest of you. You know, we have a tendency to worship things that God has given us to enjoy. So only God gets the place of worship. We all have an idol problem, every one of us. So we're going to keep coming back to this over and over again. Only God. Only God. No other gods. Don't make gods of gold or silver. Okay? So he starts there. And then he says, I want you to make an altar of earth for me. Notice that. Verse 24. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen in every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. Now, no, notice that. Because God is God, the only proper way to worship God is through sacrifice. Sacrifice is always the way that we worship the true and living God. Now, I say that it's 2013. I grew up in a, in a culture that's an acquisition culture. So right as you say, sacrifice is the only proper way to worship the true and living God, I realize that I just, statement just runs roughshod over the way we were all raised, the way we were all born, the, the culture that we live in. But it's still the biblical reality that a holy God deserves sacrifice. So the question is, is how's that sacrificial worship going for you? You know what the sacrifice God wants more than anything? He wants you. He wants you. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 12? 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, each one of us is a living sacrifice. We're all called to sacrifice a self-styled life. And we come to God and we say, God, what do you want for this life? I give you myself. I know it's great when you, when you give God yourself. God knows better what to do with us than we know what to do with ourselves. And listen, oftentimes, oftentimes people say, well, I don't want to give myself to God because I hate bugs and I don't want God to send me to Africa. Like I just, like, it, it's like God's like the big cosmic meanie, right? Who is just going to take you and do the worst possible thing with your life. And that's a lie because God loves you and he's for you. See, if we give God our lives, God knows why he created us. He knows the gifts and the skill set he placed within us. He knows all about us. and He knows this is your sweet spot in life. But what's interesting is because we live in a culture that says your life is your own, we never ask God, what do you want from this life? So the sacrifice that God really wants from our lives is us. That's the true worship, giving him ourselves, saying, God, this life is yours. All that I am is yours. I surrender all. But that's the way you worship the holy God. You give him everything. And what's beautiful about when you give God everything, God doesn't keep it all for himself because God ain't into acquisition. God is into blessing. Isn't that what we see in the Gospels? When that, when that little guy brings Jesus few fish and some loaves. Jesus takes them, he blesses them, he breaks them, and everybody eats. And they have leftovers. Jesus is like, yeah, man, thanks for the bread. It's all mine. I'm hungry. He doesn't do that. He takes the little we give him, and he does exceedingly abundantly with it. So brothers and sisters, don't hold yourselves back. Because the almighty God the only proper way to relate to him is through sacrifice. And that sacrifices ourselves for the world. And the reason we know that that's the case is that's exactly when God came as a man, Jesus. He gave himself so that the world may have life. And that's the beauty of following Jesus. The beauty of following Jesus is you realize that when I die to myself— and I give my life for everybody else, not as a doormat because you love God and you don't let people take advantage of you because God values you too much to be taken advantage of. But as you serve the world, you learn what Jesus taught, that it's more blessed to give than receive. For the joy that was set before Jesus, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated down at the right hand of the Father. So when you give of yourself, you really get yourself. You really get the real you, the you that God intended you to be. So we worship this holy God through sacrifice. Now notice, God is concerned about the altar. First he says, make an altar of earth in verse 24. And then in verse 25, and if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone. For if you use a tool on it, you have profaned it. Now, why is this important? Because we can't do any work. Our ideas of work. See, if you make this beautiful, ornate altar, people might worship the altar and say, oh, look, look at a good job I did. So in order for God to be blessed by it, it can't be something like, I did this, I sweat real hard, I made it all perfect. No, it's interesting. God's ultimate altar was just two beams of wood where Jesus died. Didn't need to be all decorative. Just a few beams of wood. So it's important to God that we do not try and inject and put our fingerprints all over everything. God likes it simple. He just wants it of dirt. If it's of stone, it can't be hewn stone. Don't put your tools to it. God likes it a little rugged and rustic. Because he doesn't want us to take any credit in the process. You can imagine them off. Imagine this. Imagine somebody builds a beautiful altar for sacrifice and they're, they're giving all these offerings. Everyone's like, wow, that's a beautiful altar. Missing the whole point of why it's there. The altar is only amazing because of the God 
who is being sacrificed to. So we got to be careful we don't put the cart before the horse. And now also, very interesting last verse here, nor shall you go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. Now, you have to realize that in that culture, undergarments were not the norm. This was long before boxers briefs, boxer briefs, or whatever else your thing is. Long before that. And it was very normal in that culture for the priests to wear what was the equivalent of long skirts. And because they didn't have undergarments, and if there were stairs going up to the altar, someone may catch a sneak peek of something they shouldn't see. And it will distract people from worship. So God says, no steps, because I don't want anybody to be distracted. Okay? Now, what's interesting is if you look at the cultures that surrounded the children of Israel, there was all sorts of what they would call cultic sexual practices, where with the worship of the different deities, there was all sorts of temple prostitutes, both male and female. And so you can imagine in that type of a more carnal, quote-unquote, worship environment, those steps could be used in a lot of different ways. So God's like, look, we're going to do something brand new here. I don't want people to be rising up to it. I don't want anyone to be distracted from what's going to go on. Now, we move into chapter 21. Now, in chapter 21, verses 1 to 11, this deals with the ideas of servants or slaves. Now, before we begin this section, we have to remember two things. For you and I, in 2013, the 21st century, we're all, when we hear about servants or slaves, our cultural history is that of African slavery, where people, mostly Caucasian people, went to other places, they kidnapped and enslaved people and made them work for life. Okay? And that is wrong on every level. And we're going to see it in this chapter. It's wrong. Now, when America was founded, they didn't abolish slavery from the beginning. Why? Because the, the colonies were splitting up over that point alone. Because some Christians read this and said, look, we're allowed to have slaves. And other ones said, no, we're not. And it ended up coming up later when the country almost split over it during the, the, um, the Civil War. Thank you. I'm not going through all the wars in my head. Yeah, that one. The Civil War. But listen. What this is talking about is not kidnapping people and putting them in service for life. And we're going to see it right in this chapter. It's going to say, if you kidnap someone, that's capital crime. So when we're looking at this, we need to put this not in our context, but we need to put it in the context in which it was written so that we can understand it. So that's the first thing. Second, don't miss the fact that the children of Israel had just been slaves in Egypt. And the first thing that God starts to put parameters around is the way that they're supposed to allow people to be servants. Don't miss that. They had just been delivered from slavery in Egypt. And now he's saying the very first thing that God starts to talk about in the law is how do we treat people who are servants? Now, you have to realize that in this culture, there was no such thing as corporations, business partnerships that we have in modern time. Almost, virtually all of the business in ancient times were household or cottage industries, which means that each house, people had a skill, people who had these skills, they would have more work. Some people didn't have the same type of skills, right? And so people worked for a household. That's what they did. Now, I'm going to read a little bit, and I'm going to try and qualify as I go, because I don't know how many times, and when I first started reading the Bible. I was like, oh, the Bible condones slavery. How can I even think about this being true? But it was, it's not that the Bible condones slavery. It's just, I just don't get it. I didn't get it. So I'm going to read some stuff, and then I'm going to qualify some things. I'm going to help explain how this is an African slavery, and you're going to see it right from the beginning. But if I don't explain everything to your liking, that's why we have the, the text in your questions portion, because I try and get, touch all of it, but I know that I can't. So if I miss something, you can always feel free to text it in. If you think I'm wrong, feel free to text that in as well. We could talk about that as well. Notice what it says. Chapter 21, verse 1. Now these are the judgments which you shall set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh year he shall go free and pay nothing. 
If he comes in by himself, then he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife and she has borne to him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out by himself. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go free. Then his master, verse 6, shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl. And he shall serve him forever. And if a man sells his daughter to be a female slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master who has betrothed her to himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. She shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has dealt deceitfully with her. And if he has betrothed her to his son, he shall deal with her according to the custom of daughters. If he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, and her marriage rights. And if he does not do these three for her, then she shall go out free without paying money. Okay. It's a big section. There's a lot in there. First, notice, if you buy a Hebrew servant, a Hebrew servant had four basic ways that they might become a slave of another Hebrew. According to Leviticus 25, 39, in extreme poverty, they might sell themselves to work for somebody. Second, a father may sell his children into servitude. Exodus 21, 7. We're going to get to that in a second. In the case of bankruptcy, a man might become a servant to his creditors. And then finally, if a thief had nothing to pay proper restitution for what they stole, then they could become a servant. Those are the four main ways. Now think about this. Think about this. So the four ways that someone became a slave is if they couldn't provide for themselves, they were indentured servants to somebody else. Now I want to give you a newsflash. That's what each one of us are today. Because we don't own our houses, we don't own our cars, we don't own our food, we have jobs. And we work for people to pay for our lives. That's the exact same thing. It's the exact same thing. If you didn't have money to provide for yourself, you can say, look, I'm going to go and work for this guy. So that this person's business is thriving, mine is not. I'm going to work for him so that I can provide for myself. Parents could sell their children to be servants. You might say, that's horrible. It's actually not horrible. It went on in this country for a long, long time where kids actually had jobs and worked for their families and helped provide. How many of you did that growing up? You said, hey man, your parents needed help and you went and you worked. You got a side job. And, and instead of kids just taking the money and buying Xbox games or iPods or whatever, they actually bought food for the family. You might say, oh, it sounds so terrible. That's just the way the world is. You got to realize the way we live in the West is not the norm for the rest of the world. It's not the norm. I said it last week. Any of us in here makes $50,000 a year, that puts you in the top 1% of the richest people in the world. We're the 1%, almost all of us. And those of us who aren't the 1%, we're in the top 2%. So the rest of the world doesn't function the way we function here in America, given the blessings that our nation has received and the opportunities we have. But most of us, the way we function on a daily basis, don't raise your hand, but how many of you would quit your job if you could? I wouldn't, but a lot of us would. I I like what I do. You know, but it's like if, if you didn't have a mortgage payment and, and bills to pay and a car payment, if you didn't really love that Netflix subscription and all that stuff, you wouldn't do what you're doing, but you really like all that stuff. You like wearing clothes and we're happy that you do too. You know, we like wearing different clothes every day and all this stuff. And, you know, we, we work to s- supply all that stuff. That's exactly what's going on here. They called it servants or slaves. But that's exactly the same thing. Now notice how different this is. If you buy a Hebrew servant, verse 2, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh year he shall go free and pay nothing. Check that out. Just the way God worked for six days in creating everything and he rested on the seventh day, if you became an indentured servant, you work for six years, seventh year you just leave and you don't pay anything. So 
Your circumstances or your choice may have you be an indentured servant in that culture, a slave, but after six years, you go free. So this is completely different from African slavery. It's completely different. You worked at six years. At the end of six years, you go free on the seventh year. Notice in verse three, if he comes in by himself, he should go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. What that means is whatever you go into your servanthood time with, you leave with. So if you came in as a single person, you leave as single. If you come in married, let's say you're married and you have kids and you fall on hard times and you have a, 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 somebody you know who's got a great thriving business, you say, look, can I work for you? If you come in with your wife and kids, you leave with them as well. So notice that. If you become a slave for somebody in that culture— and you're married, your kids and your wife are your own. You're, the slave owner doesn't take them as their own. But now notice what happens. Because the law is meant to deal with the civil, the ceremonial, and the moral components of Jewish culture. Civil. How are we going to be organized? What do we value? Ceremonial. How are we going to worship God? And then, of course, moral. What is right and wrong? This is a civil component. Because you can imagine somebody goes in single— but all of a sudden, maybe there's another servant who's working there, and they're like, they're checking each other out over the crop. And they're both servants of this guy, and they're like, hey, um, we'd like to get married. You can, ima- you, guys, you can imagine this happening, right? So look at what it says. Verse 4, if a master has given him a wife, and she has borne him sons or daughters, his wife and her children shall be the masters, and he shall go out by himself. You see what happens now. So if there's two people who are servants of a master— and they get married. And it's time for the, for the husband to go free. But the wife is, is, is the master's. The wife can't leave because she's also a servant until her six years is up. You see, so this is dealing with how does this all work? It'd be kind of like if you're working in a business. Imagine you're uh, an investment banker, right? And you're, and you're investing with your boss's money. And you make a boatload of money. Do you get to take all the money out? What's the answer? No, unless you're stealing. Because you started with your master's money. Yeah, you might get a great bonus. See, it just shows the law of how things are working here. So, what it says is that if a woman is married to a man, once one of them goes free, the other one has to finish up their time before they're allowed to go free because they're still indentured to their master. Now, notice what happens in verse 5. And this shows how it's completely different, completely different from African slavery. But if a master plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go free. So now you have somebody who's ready to go free and says, I love working here. This is the best job. I'm doing exactly what I want to do. I love working for this family. This is amazing. Notice what he'll do in verse 6. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. Why? So that's not spur of the moment. He goes before the leaders and say, I really want to do this. I want to commit my life to working for this family. It's not under false pretense. He's not under any sort of uh, a force by the master. He goes of his own volition and says, look, I want to spend the rest of my life working here in this house. You go to the judges, then you shall bring him to the door of the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Wow. Ear piercing in the Bible. If somebody works for somebody on their seventh year when it's time to go free, and they say, look, I love working here. I love this place. I love being a part of this. Then he go to the judge and say, I want to spend the rest of my life working for this family. And then he goes back, and now he's a voluntary servant. This is where the concept of the bond servant comes from. The bond servant is free to do whatever they want, but says, I want to stay here. And they got a big old earring in their ear. And any time you went to a house and you saw the servant with an earring in their ear, they're like, that was not like, a, like just an ornament. That was like, this person is a special servant because he loves serving his master. And that's why the apostle Paul and the, and, and the other apostles and disciples, they called themselves bond servants. Because they're saying, look, I'm free to do whatever I want, but I love my master and I love the family of God and I'm just going to serve them with my whole life. That's where it comes from. So this is for somebody who's been granted their freedom but says, look, I just want to stay working here. You might say, why would would you do that? Because, listen, some jobs in that culture were great situations. You're skilled at it. You love doing it. The master took care of you, compensated you very well. 
It's like a lot. There's some people who like, you could have retired a long time ago. You'd be like, why would I want to retire? I love what I'm doing. I love everything about what I'm doing. This is great. So why stop? Just keep going. Sure, I could retire, but who'd want to? It's the bond servant principle. Very, very simple. Now, look at what happens in verse 7, because now we get to some specific things about female servants. It says, if a man sells his daughter to be a female slave, she shall not go out as the male servants do. Now, when it talks about a female slave, don't think about sex trafficking. It'll deal with some of the, the morality issues of it. But this is not like sells his daughter to be a prostitute. But in that culture, if you needed help, your kids would work. A man could sell his daughter to be a servant. Now notice what happens. Because a lot of this idea of a female being a servant is also tied to her being betrothed to the master of the house. Now in that culture, all marriages were done by arrangement. They're all done by arrangement. A lot more like cultures like India than like America, where you say, hey, I think we love each other. We're going to get married. In that culture, people made arranged marriages. And all all husbands paid a bride price. All husbands did. You paid a, a bride price. Now people would say, oh, that's so demeaning to women. Actually, no, it's not. You only pay for things that you value. And part of the bride price in that culture was a man showing a woman's family, I am serious about marrying this woman. And you know what? I bet we'd have a lot less divorces in America if we reinstituted the bride price. I think all of you fathers of daughters are saying, amen, we can bring the bride price back right now. Can you imagine if you're like, oh, you want to to marry my daughter, eh? Okay, yeah, it's going to cost you a hundred grand. You'll see how serious the guy is. That's right. That's not demeaning of a woman. It's saying, look, we value her that much. You're showing the family, look, I'm willing, I'm willing to get some skin in the game. I'm willing to pony up because I really love this woman. So, see, we have to think about these things in context, because we read it in the West with our limited view of the world, very specific cultural goggles. I would say, oh, this is all so absurd. It's so misogynistic. The Bible hates women. It's like, huh? What universe are you living in? What universe? A bride price was a, was a sign of value, and guess what? They didn't pay for husbands neither. So apply that how you want to. <laughs> You're like, it's like, amen, Pastor Daniel, keep going. But look at what happens. So a man tells his daughter to be a slave. And right in verse 8, notice, if she does not please her master who has betrothed her to himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. So now, a man sells his daughter as a servant. There's betrothal though. But if the guy decides that he doesn't want the woman, he can't just discard her. He has to let her be redeemed by her family. See, this is all about the dignity of women. In that culture where women didn't work, where if they they weren't attached to a man or to their family, they had no opportunities to, to, to do it themselves, saying, look, if you get betrothed and he's not happy with you, you can't just discard her. You can't just leave her on the side. You have to let her be redeemed. You have to let one of her family members come and have her back. Beautiful. It's beautiful. The book of Ruth, speaking of this, the idea of the kinsman redeemer. And don't miss the fact that Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. Just as Boaz redeemed Ruth, Jesus comes to redeem his bride, the people of God. Don't miss that. That's just a side note. Just a side note. Notice what happens. In the middle of verse 8, he shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has dealt deceitfully with her. So now imagine a man, he pays a bride price. He decides he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't like her. She doesn't make his eggs very well or whatever else the problem is. He can't just get rid of her. He can't sell her to a foreign people. Why? Because he's dealt deceitfully with her. Why? Because he paid the bride price to marry her and now he's not going to take care of it. Now he's got to take care of her. That's what this is saying. And guess what? You read Near Eastern laws of any culture and there's none like this. There's none. You'll never find the care for women like you find in the Bible in any ancient laws. You'll never find it. Why? Because the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were the best thing that ever happened to women. Seriously. Look at any culture that the gospel is not the foundation of the way they treat women, and you'll see what's going on. We were all totally, absolutely, absolutely upset when we found out what the Taliban did to women in Afghanistan. 
And that's what happens in cultures where the gospel's not at the core. And listen, I've had people say, well, Pastor Daniel, are you really sure? Have you done the research? Yeah, you look at it. And they'll say, oh, what about places like Sweden? Where Christianity is small. But yeah, even though there's a small number of Christians in Sweden today, look at the foundation of their, of, of their laws. It's all Christian. It's all there. So, so that Judeo-Christian biblical view, now all of a sudden women have all sorts of care rights. There's concern for them. They can't be sold. Notice verse 9. And if he has betrothed her to his son, he shall deal with her according to the customs of daughters. He's saying, look, if you betrothed her to one of your sons, you've got to deal with her like one of your own daughters. You have to take care of her. Notice verse 10. And if he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, and her marriage rights. He's saying, look, if a, if a, if a female is sold to be a man's wife and he chooses to take another wife. Now, we do know in that time, polygamy was normal. Just because the Bible says it happens doesn't mean that's the way it's supposed to be. We have all, we'll talk about all other laws about that. But listen, the news doesn't condone everything it tells you. It just tells you what's going on. No news agency condoned the bombings in Boston, but they did tell you that bombings in Boston happened. So the Bible, every time you see polygamy at play, it's always in the negative. It's always in the negative. But he says, look, but if a man does take another wife, he can't diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights, which speaks of intercourse between a husband and a wife. He can't diminish her in any way. He still has to provide for all of her needs and still be a loving spouse. I hope you realize that that's kind of, that's kind of powerful. The rights that God gives to women in his newly redeemed people. Verse 11, and if he does not do these things for her, then, he, then she shall go out free without paying money. So if he doesn't do her right, she gets to go free and she doesn't have to buy her way out. Beautiful. Now, in verse 12, now we move to laws concerning violence. Laws concerning violence. Notice, verse 12, he who strikes a man so that he dies, surely shall be put to death. However, if he did not lie in wait, but God delivered him into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place where he may flee. But if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. And he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He who kidnaps a man and sells him. And if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. And he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Now notice, there's a number of capital crimes. The homicide laws. First, if you strike somebody who dies and you do it with premeditation, premeditated murder. When you murder somebody, then your life shall be taken. Remember we saw in the commandments, you shall not murder. So the punishment for murder is a just punishment of murder. Now notice what it says in verse 13. However, if he did not lie in wait, but God delivered him into his hands, then I will appoint for you a place where you may flee. Now what that means is that accidental deaths happen. They happen. You can imagine someone swinging an axe and all of a sudden you go to swing it and all of a sudden the axe head flies off and it nails the guy right across from you. You didn't mean to do it. You weren't like, hey, I'm going to plan how I'm going to off this guy. Right? And it happens. Now in that culture, vengeance killing was the norm. If somebody killed your, it's kind of like the Italians in the mob. You know, you kill my brother, I'll kill your brother. That was kind of, that was just the culture. Vengeance killing was just the way it is. It's still that way in some cultures today. We don't really do that a lot in America, but that's the way it is. And so what happens if somebody killed somebody on accident without premeditation, then there's a place of asylum where they can go, where they can be protected by the people of the city until the, the judges hear it out. So this is the, the forerunner of what will ultimately be called the cities of refuge, which we'll find in Numbers 35 and Deuteronomy chapter 19. So if you, didn't, if you did it on accident, if something happened and he didn't mean it, death didn't have to come to you. There's a place for you to go and be protected. Now, look at verse 14. But if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor, you shall kill, to kill him by treachery, you shall take him 
from my altar that he may die. So what that means is that if you act with premeditation, you can't hide at the altar, which you find in the Bible where people are, are, are going to be killed for their actions and they're, and they're hiding at the altar being like, the altar is going to protect me. And he's saying, look, if someone's hiding out in the holy place, trying to get away from the judgment that's due to them, you got to take them from my altar and you got to carry out a just punishment for what they have done. Okay, now notice verse 15. And he who strikes his father or mother shall surely be put to death. So when a child, when a child kills a parent, death comes. Verse 16, and don't miss this. He who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, he shall be put to death. You see that? This is how we know that what we just talked about is not African slavery. Because if you kidnap somebody, guess what the punishment for kidnapping is? Death. Now, you can't even be a middleman. Because you can imagine, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. If, you, if, if, if somebody who's been kidnapped is found in your hand, you're guilty. Kidnapping is punishable by death. And then finally, if a child curses their father or mother. Now, we have to realize with this, a lot of people say, oh, how can you believe the Bible? It says if kids curse their parents, then they'd be put to death. So if I use an expletive with my parents, should I be killed? Now, the idea of cursing in the Bible is not us just saying some nasty words. It's not just that. The idea is calling down God's vengeance on somebody. That's the way cursing functioned in that day. When you call down God's judgment upon somebody. So that is, that is punishable by death. But at the same time, it shouldn't surprise us that our culture allows certain things to go on that God doesn't approve of. We know, we know that the fifth commandment is you should honor your father and mother. Our culture doesn't value that as much. I mean, we have TV shows like Nanny 911. Because kids will go crazy. And parents don't know how to control their kids because they want to be their friends rather than lead them. So it's interesting. God values the family that much. And God, and I said it before when we looked at honoring your father and mother, that the reason God wants children to be obedient to their parents is because children need to learn how to have control over their wills. Because when they come to Christ and they realize that they have been set free in Christ, that freedom only functions in a godly way when the will is already in check. And a lot of the problems we have in our day and age is that people don't know how to keep their will in check. Everything that they feel, they just go do it. And they don't think consequentially. They don't know how to curb their emotions. And everyone acts crazy. And we wonder why things are going on. Why? Because as children, we didn't learn how to have control over our will. And God wants us. God wants our wills to be under the authority of the Holy Spirit so that we can function in the glorious liberty that we're given in Christ in a way that can honor the world, God, and ourselves. But if we never get the will in check, we can't handle God's freedom. Because we'll always use it as an opportunity for the flesh. We always will. So God values that children honor their parents. And if they call down God's cursing and judgment upon their parents, that is, that is a, uh, an offense punishable by death in that culture. Notice verse 18. If, a man contend, if men contend with each other and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist and he does not die but is confined to his bed, if he rises again and walks about outside with his staff, then he who struck him shall be acquitted. He shall only pay for the loss of his time and shall provide him to be thoroughly healed. Now, this is now speaking about when men are knuckleheads and fight with one another. Okay, totally. Listen, guys, don't be knuckleheads. Okay, I don't know. I don't even, I don't want to go on a tangent, but guys like to scrap with one another. It's like, talk about small men. Small men are guys who need to beat up other guys so they feel good about their manhood. That's what I love about Jesus, meek Jesus. Jesus was the strongest man who ever lived. He could have MMA'd anybody and housed them. He didn't need to, though. He didn't need to prove his manhood because the only time you need to prove your manhood is when you're scared about it. Don't fake it till you make it, guys. Just be men. Honor God. Honor other people. Be peacemakers. That's true manhood. That's what Jesus did. 
didn't need to beat some guy up. Okay, I'm going to end my tangent. But if God, really, in my translation, verse 18, if guys start scrapping with one another and they start hitting each other with stones or fists, and if a guy gets hurt, then you need to pay him for this time lost. That's what it says. And if he puts him in the hospital, you got to pay till he's better. So there is remuneration when guys are fighting with one another and a guy loses time at work. You got to take care of the guy who you hurt. Look at verse 20. And if a man beats his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notice that. If somebody works for you and you beat them with a rod and they die, you will be punished. Verse 21, notwithstanding, if he remains alive a day or two, he shall not be punished for he is his property. Now, what that means is this. If, if somebody's a servant and they do something wrong and there is some sort of physical punishment, if they die, that means the punishment was excessive. If they don't die, then there's an opportunity to bring them before the magistrates and hear the matter out. Okay, that's what it means. Now, praise God we don't have employers who can beat us in this day and age. Or we shouldn't unless you play basketball on the Rutgers basketball team of late. I'm a Rutgers, never mind. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just, we'll just leave that off for now. Look at verse 22. If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished accordingly as the woman's husband imposes on him and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if any harm follows, then he shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe, now, what that means, if two guys start scrapping and there's a pregnant woman there and anything happens to that woman at all or her child, then they're responsible for it. You, and, you know, you can see what they're doing here. They're taking a case and they're like, what happens if this happens? And what happens if this happens? And what happens if this happens? Now, notice that the way these things are, are delineated is whatever the judges or the, or the woman's husband says, this is proper remuneration for what you've done. And if anything happens to the child, an eye for an eye, and, and this is just the basic laws of justice. Whatever you do will be measured back to you. Now, if you follow bumper sticker theology, you'll read that Gandhi said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And so the idea is that an eye for an eye just isn't very smart. That's what he's saying. But what Gandhi fails to realize is the reason the Bible speaks of justice as an eye for an eye is because God knows that in our fallenness, all of us want to escalate. Right? We all do. Someone says something mean to me, I'll say something exceedingly mean to you. You poke out my eye, I will take off your head. That's what happens to fallen humanity, and we all know what it's like. So the reason God puts in these parameters, which means that any punishment needs to fit the crime, not escalate it beyond the crime. And that's what Gandhi failed to realize in making his statement. Because the human condition will always escalate, right? You took 20 bucks from me, you owe me 80. And oftentimes our punishments don't fit the crime because we are greedy people and we are vengeful people. And this is in there to try and hem us in and protect us from ourselves that God may be honored. Notice verse 26. If a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant and destroys it, he shall let him go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, he shall let him go free for the sake of the tooth. Now notice this. If a person hurts, if a person hurts somebody who works for them, they lose an eye, they get to go free. They get even more. Why? Because somebody who has authority over other people needs to treat them right. If, if you knock a servant's tooth out, you got to let him go free. Don't just give him a tooth back. Don't just take him to the dentist. Bless him with even more. His freedom. His freedom. Now, verse 28. We move now to animals. And we're really going to look at intent and neglect. You know what? Let me do this. I could keep going here, but I'll have you here all night. So we have more laws to do next week. So we'll pick up here at verse 28. But let me close. I want to close with a thought for you. When we learn about kidnapping, murder, 
violence, servanthood. Each one of these things, if we look at our lives, if we look at our lives, even though we maybe have never kidnapped somebody, we have cursed people. Oftentimes we don't treat people properly. Oftentimes in the heat of the moment, we escalate situations. And because they come so common for us, we have a tendency just to dismiss them. But it's important for us to realize tonight that the only way God dismisses them is by nailing Jesus to the cross. Because the Bible says, if you sin, you will surely die. That's why death happens in this world. Because sin has stained everything. And in each one of these laws, we can see, if, we, if you men, if you treat women without the proper dignity and respect that God has given them, then you have fallen way short. And all of us have. And that, again, is exactly why God sent Jesus to die on a cross for us. Because all of us have fallen so far short. And what's beautiful about that is when we fall short of one another's expectations or when someone falls short of our expectations, we get rid of them. But when we have fallen short of God's expectations, he came and got us and brought us back to him in Christ. So no matter how we've all fallen short in regards to God's law, there is forgiveness for us in Christ. If we would simply, each one of us, come to Jesus and respond to him and say, yes, Lord, I want forgiveness. I want to be cleansed. And if you do that, brother or sister, Jesus has already shed his blood for you and for me. He's already done it because God knew that we needed it. And I don't know about you, every single day the gospel becomes more glorious to me because I see how far short I fall every single day in a million ways, in more ways than I can fathom. And God says, yeah, Daniel, I know you fall so far short, but I love you so much I sent my own son for you. And that's just not because I'm special. You're special because God created you and he loves you. So no matter how far short you've fallen, come to him tonight and let him wash and cleanse your life. Let's bow our hearts and pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your holy word. We thank you for these righteous laws. And Lord, they're challenging for us. It's a different culture, different parameters. But Lord, we see your wisdom in it. We see your dignity in it. We see your righteousness in it. And Father, forgive us for wearing our cultural Western goggles too tightly. Oftentimes we think that our way is always the right way and we don't think through things the way that we ought to. And God, I ask, Lord, is that you would bring us down deep into your word, that we would feast upon your words, like Jeremiah, who said, your word was found by me, O Lord, and I did eat it, and it became unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Lord, we want your word to well up in us and bear such glorious fruit. Lord, thank you for the forgiveness that we have in Christ. Thank you that two pieces of wood is a sufficient altar for you. And we thank you for salvation in the name of Jesus. And Lord, draw us, each one of us, to the cross. Lead us to the cross. Let us dwell at the feet of the cross. And behold the finished work of Jesus on our behalf. And Lord, let us live in response to that. Thank you that you have set us free from the, our failings and the curse of the law and set us free into the kingdom of God. And we ask it all in Jesus' name and all of God's family said, Amen.